Okay, welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is lecture three, XML. Um, today I'm actually kind of a walking advert for another course of mine. So if after this semester you'd actually like to take a step back and take a, an intensive introduction to computer science, um, feel free to take this, this class. Um, comes with t-shirts. Um, but we'll actually look at one of the outgrowths of that particular class in just a moment. But first a teaser as to what's ahead. So included in project one specification, the PDF of which is on the course's website now, is this menu here. Those of you who are local might remember fondly, I hope, a little place called Three Aces. It was a little pizzeria up by the law school on Mass Ave. They sadly closed down a while ago. Uh, it was cute that they had um, one of those retro Pac-Man games that you'd sit down, look down at the CRT with the glass looking out at you. But that too is, is now gone. But we, they, they live on in terms of their menu. Um, what's nice about their menu is that this is kind of a typical pizza sub kind of place. They've got pizzas with toppings and grinders and salads and spaghetti and such. But it's actually a pretty compelling real world data set in that if you were asked as, in, uh, as a developer to implement an e-commerce site of, of sorts for them, you'd have to deal with this data. And that's in fact what Project One will challenge you with. We will hand you this data. We will then say, uh, we are, um, suppose the owner of this pizzeria has come to you and says he really wants to get his business online. And so he needs you to implement a website of sorts with which people can visit, uh, browse what they have to sell, uh, add items to a shopping cart, uh, and then to ultimately check out of this shopping cart, uh, check out of this online store so that they can proceed to make those deliveries. So on first glance, um, seems all very straightforward. You got pizzas in a couple of sizes. Everything seems nicely categorized. No problem. So the first question at hand is going to be, how do you represent this data? What kind of database backend do you use? Well, frankly, a lot of times in life, especially for relatively small data sets, it's not necessary. And it's perhaps too heavy handed a solution to whip out something like an actual database server, whether MySQL, uh, PostgreSQL, uh, Microsoft Access, Oracle, whatever your favorite database is. It's just more effort than is necessary to solve the problem. And in fact, if this is going to be run by a local pizzeria, you know, they might just have a sort of um, inexpensive web hosting plan where you don't really get many fancy features. They might just have a PC under the desk that's supposed to be on the internet through a cable modem and they want to take orders from it. And so, alt and more, most importantly, perhaps, you know, because they're not willing to pay so much for this project, you don't really have the time or the resources to implement a whole administrative backend where they can modify their prices, modify their menu. Frankly, you'd much rather leverage something they already have, like Microsoft Notepad, so that they can edit a configuration file, change their menu very easily. They've used a text editor or word processor before. And in the real world, this might very well be compelling. Why spend extra days, hours, weeks implementing a whole backend interface if, frankly, just editing a text file might suffice. Now, um, to do this, you could come up certainly with your own proprietary text format. You could use CSV files. But because there is some notion of categorization here, feels like there might be even some notion of hierarchy with different sizes and variants of these items, um, XML, frankly, um, is a pretty compelling option to consider. So one of the things we'll look at today is in more detail at this spec for XML, what its features are. It is more interesting than just open bracket, close bracket, not so much because of the language, but because of the tools that are out there. And many of them are integrated now into PHP and other languages. And we'll introduce in particular a query language called XPath, which, which you can query data stored in XML format, much like you could data in a database. Um, to, to be honest, I have to date, you know, anytime there's sort of a small self-contained project I need to implement, frankly, I generally reach for XML these days, whether it's to read from or even write to, because it's so relatively easy to do, as we'll see in just a moment. Case in point is the course's own website, whereby we configure almost all of the pages with little XML files. Unfortunately, in the real world, and is the case in this menu, which is why we've hung on to it for so long, you start to notice some inconsistencies in the data that uh, would make a computer scientist cringe. But in the real world, frankly, it's just pretty straightforward to human reading it. But what are some of the anomalies? Well, check out the categories of pizza. We've got uh, tomato and cheese, small, for $5.50, then a large in the other column for $9.75. And that pattern continues, small, large, small, large, small, large, bam, extra cheese. 125, 185. Well, that's not a 
pizza. And so semantically, it doesn't really belong where it is, but you know, no human is really going to think twice about this. It's still pretty straightforward. But when it comes to deciding for yourself, the developer, how do you handle this situation? Well, that's one of the questions you're going to have to answer. It's real data. It's not a feature they want to just throw out just because it's annoying for you to think about. Um, and so we have to figure out how to embody this somehow. Um, you have specialty pizzas as another category unto itself, and yet it doesn't seem to follow the same pattern, even though small and large here are the same price. So same idea, but there's somewhat of a difference there. Um, I like these things where we have another category of salads and grinders and wraps. And then this one's just spaghetti or ziti. Um, so apparently now it's not so much a line item. Now there's this optional component where you have to, online, be able to communicate to the store, do you want, you don't just want with sauce, you don't just want with sausage, you want presumably spaghetti or ziti. So how you implement that selection is another question at hand. Now thankfully, at the end of the day, you don't have all that many building blocks to work with. And built into HTML and most any website these days are only the basics. Text areas, text fields, radio buttons, check boxes, buttons. Um, and surely you could craft your own UI mechanisms, but you can do a lot. You can squeeze a lot of functionality out of those basics. And one of the questions to keep asking yourself from this project onward, especially with your final project, is are your design decisions making sense? Are they straightforward? Is it the right mechanism? Because frankly, there's a whole lot of bad websites um, designed out, there are a whole lot of poorly designed websites out there, and that's generally the result of folks not having given sufficient thought to these questions. So small a data set, though this is relatively speaking, it offers a lot of fun opportunities to decide you know, what is the best way to do this. And what's neat in a class of, um, we have 40, 30, 40 locals, another 30, 40 distance students, so a class of 80 or 100, um, you see a huge number of variants on uh, implementation choices. And so realize that the specs are pretty much uh, defined much like Project Zero to be checkboxes where we specify some requirements, um, some guidelines and such, but whenever not specified explicitly by us, it's really up to you to interpret as you see fit, much like a real world project. And you can certainly reach out to us with questions at help at cs75.net. And also via the course's Google group. So this is our fault for miscommunicating earlier on uh, internally and externally. So there's a whole lot of chatter going across two different listservs right now, um, which is fine for us because we see both of them. But the problem is some of you might not be on one or the other. So a quick uh, correction here. So Project Zero did get it right. An earlier email from us got it wrong. Um, so in the interest of getting everyone onto the same list, if only so that you're not missing anything super important, um, it's the top one per Project Zero that you should absolutely be on. That's the one that the staff, the TFs and I, will send official announcements to. Um, you can find its subscription information in, um, what did we do? Project Zero mentions this, and then we sent out the link. But if you still need that, um, go ahead and just email help at cs75.net and we'll reply with it. Now the other one you're welcome to subscribe to. Um, this is the course's open courseware list, which means for folks not taking the course in the given semester who just like to play along at home, work on projects, ask questions and so forth. So the types of questions that have been asked are pretty much appropriate for both lists. But so that we're actually a coherent class, um, go with the top one. And we'll circulate this again via email if need be. Our apologies for having made that uh, confusion happen. All right, so today is ultimately about XML and then designing the first of your real projects. Um, what I thought I'd do is draw your attention to a real, uh, real world, albeit on Harvard's campus, project of our own that we've been working on in this class and by nature of the content in this class, this one as well. So this site has existed for some time um, on campus in several different forms. This is not the URL. Um, events.cs50.net. And this is actually co-branded for the Harvard Med School right now and for the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and for the college. There's several different versions of this site floating around. This too is not the, this is the right address. There we go. Flaky internet access, it seems, is all. Um, so this is an example that we'll touch upon um, maybe one or more times during the semester, because it, too, is an interesting data challenge. So this is a website that we've put together um, for co various courses purposes and also for real users purposes that aggregates as many events that are happening on Harvard's campus as possible all in one place. Um, we realized a few years ago that because Harvard's such a big place and because everyone operates fairly independently, student groups, departments alike, there are 
every sort of calendaring system out there on campus. Some proprietary, some open source, but thankfully there are a few standards out there. One of them is called iCalendar. If you've ever received an attachment via Microsoft Outlook to add a, a meeting to your calendar, even Google Calendar, it's generally in the form of an attachment, something called dot, uh, something dot ICS. Uh, where iCalendar is the name, the full name of that format, and inside of there is just some text that describes the start time, the end time, the description, and all of that, and you can import it into your calendar. Another popular format is CSV files, which we discussed a bit last week. Um, Outlook itself and Yahoo Calendar allow you to export ex events in CSV format, and certainly any programmer could dump their own proprietary database in CSV format pretty straightforwardly. So at this point, we have about 200 some odd calendars um, from all of Harvard's campuses aggregated here and using what's called a cron job, which is a little program running on a Unix or Linux system, it synchronizes with the data uh, every number of hours and then renders it in this searchable format. And so I bring this um, to your attention, one, because frankly, if you're looking for something to do on Harvard's campus, well, here you go, events.cs50.net. Um, frankly, one of the motivations for this latest revamp of this tool was because for two years now, I've wanted to have a feature where you could uh, search with a single click for free food that is available at various events on campus. Um, and so now, what you see at top left is the whole motivation for the ridiculous amount of time that went into this, later revision, this latest revision. If you click free food, it will filter all of the events happening on campus so that these are the several different places you can get uh, pizza and ice cream and other snacks uh, on campus today. In fact, 12 p.m. tomorrow, if you're free, uh, you can have pizza lunch with the Dean of Admissions for the Duke School of Medicine, if maybe you're thinking of medical school. Um, and then there's some other fun stuff here as well. So from a dynamic websites perspective, this is very much consistent with the kinds of questions we'll ask in the course, the kind of project you might want to tackle yourself at the end of the semester. But what I did this weekend was I took a few screenshots as the site evolved um, to raise, just as a teaser for our user interfaces lecture later in the semester, some of the questions that one should be reasonably asking. So right now, um, the specific data is not so much of interest to us today, but right now, just to show you the salient features, you can filter by the current date. So you can jump uh, future or past. You can choose the campus that you actually want to search, the college, DCE, SEAS, med school, and so forth. And then over here on the right-hand side are all of the calendars that we know about. So in terms of design decisions and user interface, we relatively recently started facing a challenge. The original version of this site looked a little something like this, looked a little something like this, which was similar in spirit. It was a couple of years dated, but in terms of UI mechanisms, we had the very uh, vanilla default select menus and text fields and so forth. But one of the problems there was that if you actually click show options at top right, you would see another select menu for all of the calendars. And when you're at the point of having 200 plus calendars in a website, select menu isn't cutting it anymore because you're literally scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And you, if you don't even know a priori what the name of the calendar is, you just know some keywords, again, you're not going to want to look through this entire list. And yet you can find innumerable corporate websites where, especially it seems on technical support sites, if I have a problem with my Lenovo laptop, I have to sift through like 300 models of laptops in order to find what I'm looking for because someone here hasn't given sufficient thought to the usability of a site like this. So we were at the breaking point where this was just not viable anymore and so we needed other mechanisms and consistent with one of the themes of the course um, particularly later in the semester there is an increasing number of wonderful widgets and gadgets and libraries and whatever you want to call them increasingly on the web that you can integrate into your own projects to solve problems that just aren't that interesting for you yourself to solve. Case in point, um, one of the reasons the previous incarnation of this website did not have a little calendar whereby you could select a specific date or such is because it was such a pain to implement something as simple conceptually as that but in then dealing with all of the keystrokes and the left and the right paging, it was just a lot of time that we didn't really want to put in at the time. You know, now, thankfully, there are innumerable options. This happens to be a library called XJS, E-X-T-J-S. Um, it plays nicely with a few, stand, um, few de facto standards out there. jQuery is one. We'll talk about that in our JavaScript lectures. Um, YUI is Yahoo's user interface library is another one. MooTools is another one. 
And we'll revisit all of these libraries. But in short, you have a whole bunch of UI mechanisms that allows you to just plug in some of these modules. And for select menus, you can replace things like the uh, yesteryear's select menu, which you still see in the top right of the site here for this little quick menu. But this thing, yes, you can click and scroll like this. But if I also know vaguely that there's the word medical in there, you can also do autocomplete and very familiar things just by wiring together someone else's library. And so we tried to take increased advantage of all of these features here. Um, but in terms of design decisions, and this should help guide you perhaps questions like these with Project Zero, um, you'll notice or you'll want to ask yourself questions like this, even with something like the pizza site. So right now, one of the decisions we had to make was the order in which we want to put these form elements, for instance. So we have date, we have the notion of campus, we have at top right the notion of calendar, uh, and then below that, we somehow had to fit the notion of tags. And yet tags are a bit anomalous because, because we're using these industry standard iCalendar, it does support the notion of categories. But most people's calendaring tools don't make it easy for them to add categories to their events. And so a super majority of the events that we suck in from these various feeds have no categorization. And the CSV format itself, by nature, could have categories. But it's just you would have to put them there yourself, in which wouldn't be consistent with the way Outlook and Yahoo does it, but you could do it. So in short, we have a large amount of data, a lot of interesting data, but it's really dirty and it's not really very well standardized. And so if you present these things as categories to people, we hypothesize that you know, if you want people to be able to search by lectures, for instance, and they go to lectures and they only see a few events, we could actually have 10 times as many lectures. We just don't know about it. And so this is actually a, a hard problem to solve. And it's one of the sort of Google-like problems out there. How do you automatically categorize things? Now, it turns out that in the context of events that are targeted specifically at students, um, it's really easy with simple regular expressions and grepping mechanisms to find any event that has anything to do with free food. Because it almost always says in the description, free food or pizza. Or there's some keywords that even though there's a small failure rate where someone might say, lunch or uh, pay your own way lunch. right? You could have uh, scenarios like that where we will get it wrong. But it's actually striking how powerful a simple regular expression has been for finding all of the free food on campus. It seems if you mention food, it's because it's free, not because it, although there was one anomaly where there's a weekly outing for Thai food, but everyone pays their own way. So we might have to special case that one. But in any case, the question at hand was, well, how, what kind of UI flow should we have at the top of the site? What makes sense? And so what we hypothesize, and this isn't necessarily the best. We're going to watch people's behavior over the next few months, ask people what they think and what works well and not. We kind of figured that for an event site, it's the date that probably is the highest level idea that is your first pass at narrowing the information. That's where you would start. Um, two might be campuses, because you probably care about going to events local, maybe not all over campus. The med school is pretty far away. So filtering next by that would then allow you to hone your, your, demo, um, your can, um, your reach a little further. And in fact, because we have these different co-branded versions of the site, that drop-down auto-populates itself based on whether you're at events.college.harvard.edu or events.gss. So we can do little tricks there to save the user some keystrokes. Then you have to drill down on calendars and in search events. But you run into, and we won't dwell on the specifics of this site because they're irrelevant to pizzerias, but you run into interesting questions that not often enough get asked. For instance, if I go ahead and choose some of those drop downs and I choose the medical calendar on the Harvard Med School campus with the lectures tag, and then I proceed to do a keyword search, should I, for instance, clear all of those select menus automatically? The, the supposition being that you know, if the user has now decided to search for something, it's probably because they didn't find what they were looking for by browsing and by narrowing those results. But maybe this is counterintuitive. Maybe there are so many events at the med school that are lectures on medicine, maybe the user is just trying to filter those results. And so when I type a query into search events and hit enter, it should take what's currently showing and then filter it further rather than taking a step back and researching the whole database. So these are actually non and these are actually questions, I think, with non-obvious answers. And you have to decide based on your user base and based on the data set. Um, but you have to run, worry. Ultimately, you run the risk of alienating your users if the site doesn't behave as 
they would think it would. And unfortunately, it's hard to get inside your user's head. So one of the issues we'll talk about later in the semester is just what more questions might you want to get into the habit of using. Um, and one of the lessons that's echoed um, by a lot of people in this space is generally that you might approach the site as yourself, but you are not representative of anyone. Right? There are different types of users out there, um, and you are probably not the best judge of what their behavior might be until you actually start asking them. So I, this book actually got recommended on one of the listservs recently. It's pretty popular, and I just now started reading it. It's actually a great little book. Um, if you're looking to read stuff uh, about user interface design, human-computer interaction, this really is meant in the preface to be read like on an airplane. It's pretty digestible. It's called Don't Make Me Think. Um, and it's pretty much about good and bad design decisions. But more on this in the weeks to come. But for now, let me challenge you, Project Zero aside, don't just think about um, how to solve your, don't just focus entirely on, say, the Pizzeria's website in Project One as you browse sites for at least the next two, three months and you visit your own, pop, your own most popular websites. Think to yourself, what works? What doesn't work? What did they do that's a great idea I should incorporate into my own work? Um, and what mistakes have they made that I should absolutely avoid? I think I might have griped in an earlier lecture that um, when I went to, I think, Verizon's website recently, they refused to let me click submit because they insisted that mailin at post.harvard.edu was an invalid email address because they didn't know about subdomains. And this is perhaps some low hanging fruit, easy stuff to fix, but um, there's a lot of opportunities for better design. So today, though, we focus on design of data and the modeling of data. So this, the word uh, that's apropos right now is perhaps schema. The schema for one's data is the format in which you choose to represent it. And we'll ask the same question in a week or two's time in the context of MySQL, where we'll have more power and more design decisions to make. But with XML, do we have relatively few, which makes it a pretty good starting point. So for those unfamiliar, XML is pretty much like HTML, as I've said before, but make your own tags make your own attributes. You have to follow the same rules. You open a tag, you close it symmetrically, you can't misorder things. Um, there are a few more stringent rules than some of you might be familiar with in the world of HTML4. Like if you have an attribute value, it must be quoted with single quotes or double quotes, but it must be quoted. Unlike HTML4 and predecessors, uh, you can't just have a BR tag. It has to be a BR tag with a corresponding close tag or an empty element whereby you open and close the tag in one fell swoop. So if you've seen in my own code or uh, other folks' code, something that looks like this is br slash close bracket. This is well-formed XML. Whereas in the HTML world, you could get away with just open bracket br or even open bracket capital br. Um, and browsers, for better or for worse, will pretty much behave the same these days with all of these. Um, but we're slowly, as a world, making our way toward better adherence to standards, which make for more reliable, more deterministic rendering of sites, which means less work for us because we don't have to special case things as often. But in terms of the language itself, um, XHTML or XML itself requires that any element that's opened also be closed. It would be correct in XHTML to also say this. Even though this just looks a little silly and almost nobody does it this way, but it is in fact correct. And that would be well formed XML. Um, now, as, uh, as it relates to this, with XML and uh, not HTML or XHTML, with XML, you can pick your own tags. You can pick your own elements. So this thing here at first glance, how, what, what is this XML fragment representing, would you say? Yeah, some kind of purchase, right? And so this might be a decent approximation of what Amazon.com or someone like that uses to transmit data to and from their third parties. Um, you might be able to go to Amazon these days, buy a book from Amazon or someone else. Well, they have to convey that information to Amazon. And so one of the popular approaches these days for B2B type transactions is to use XML, maybe some proprietary format. But increasingly, is XML useful because it's um, human readable, because it's uh, non-proprietary, and because there's so many tools for it? Yeah. Ah, good. Data format, and I can't a case. Okay, good question. So in this context here, I have intentionally uh, included no empty elements, but just to push back, actually, can I spoil by jumping ahead? So I can. Let me let me fast forward to answer that, then we'll rewind slightly. So in version two of this, which you'll see in a moment, 
Um, I've ex uh, extended the definition of my XML by having a middle initial, for instance, and also an address. So for instance, if middle initial were actually a standard field, you could certainly imagine that very often being empty for people who just don't have it. Now, as an alternative, you could just omit it from the data altogether. And depending on how you've coded your application, it might not matter. Um, but that might be a compelling instance where it's there, it's a placeholder, the application won't break when it sees that it's there but empty, um, but there's no reason for there to be an initial if a human doesn't have one. So it would be valid to have like initial blank slash closed bracket? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So rolling back now, just to toss out some jargon for those unfamiliar, but most of it should be either pretty obvious or already familiar. So when we talk about XML, for instance, this so-called root element order, the, an element is an open tag, a closed tag, and everything associated with it. Whereas a tag is just the aesthetics of an open bracket slash word close bracket and then the corresponding open tag there. So an element com uh, comprises two tags um, and everything inside of it. So if you think about this, as we'll visualize in a moment, as a tree of some sort in memory that's been parsed by a computer and read into memory, you can imagine this, as the indentation suggests, somehow being implemented in RAM as a tree. Um, well, an element would be one of these nodes in the tree. And we'll put a picture to that in just a moment. So if you want to discuss something that is inside of another element, the soul to element is what we'll call a child element. Um, you can say that the person element there is a child of soul to or even a grandchild of order. After that, it's not that useful to give things specific names. But notice the format we are adhering to. The ID attribute at top right has a value, but it is indeed quoted. It doesn't matter if it's single or double quote, so long as you're consistent. And in general, it's good to be consistent throughout the file, uh, if only as a matter of style. Um, as a question here, order as an element has how many children? based on these basic definitions now. So it looks like it has three. One is sold to, and then a little sanity check. Sold on and item. So that's true, though we can actually interpret this in a slightly different way. And we'll see this, and some of this becomes language or tool specific. I would argue that I actually see, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, Seven. I think I see seven. Maybe eight. I lost track. But I see more than three children. Can you surmise what other children I'm referring to? What's that? Uh, so last name and first name. So not those. So those are actually nested inside of another element. So they're definitely not children of the order element. They are descendants thereof. But I wouldn't call them children. I'm actually looking at something else. Something else that conceptually hangs off of the order element or is inside of it. Yeah, so here's a funny thing. Like even though we generally indent code and in HTML and XHTML and now XML for human readability's sake, you know, that is technically white space. That is character content. And maybe it is, in fact, relevant. It's not necessarily up to us. Well, it's up to us to decide. Ultimately, it's not for the tool to decide unless we instruct it so. So what I was referring to here was order is the element. Well, I actually see, now that I kind of have been programming for a while, I see open bracket, order, close bracket backslash n, backslash t, or backslash n, space, 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 space. Right? So though that contiguous block of white space could be said to be a child unto itself. And sure enough, and we'll put a picture to this in a moment, that would be also what we call a node in the tree that we're constructing here verbally. It's not the same type of node. It's not an element. It's what we'll call a text node. But it does have applicability depending on the tool or the language you're using. It will affect how many children you uh, expect to get back. Now, other details here. Let's see. We have raw text, which is pretty self-explanatory, attribute value. All right. So any questions on just some of the jargon here before we focus on features? OK. So as, yep. Sorry, is the standard uppercase for nodes? Ah, good question. Um, not really. It depends. Um, Whereas in the world of HTML, the convention was generally uppercase with XHTML, which is meant to be XML compliant HTML. Um, it's all lowercase by definition. So this is no longer legit in XHTML. Um, this is either of these, though, are acceptable. In the world of XML, it's really up to you. And I would emphasize as a matter of style, um, just be consistent. So the X in XML stands for? 
extensible, right, with a little e or silly little acronym. But XML stands, oh, wait, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Forgot I put that there. So the X is indeed extensible. So what does this mean? Well, what's really nice about XML as a data format is that by design, it's constructed in such a way that you can extend the, uh, the schema you're using. You can extend your data model and insert new elements. And in theory, it should not break any of your existing code, assuming your code is written in sort of an X, in the spirit of XML. And by that, I mean this. If Amazon and its partners decide at some point, you know what, we'd really like to start transmitting more data for some of our users. Maybe not all, but at least some. In fact, we've been collecting their middle initial. We've been collecting their address. And in fact, rather than just give you one long string as the address, we've been semantically tagging things so that we know what the street address is, what the number is on that street, what the city is, what the state is. So we really want to be able to tease these things apart and we can hand them to you. And so conceptually it actually fits pretty nicely as new children of the person element. This is before. So notice person was just last name, first name. And now after, it's the same stuff but more. And what's nice, and one of the selling points of XML, is that if you have added these elements as children of existing elements, well, your code should actually keep on functioning. Because if you use the tools we'll start using today, if you use the languages like XPath we start using, the introduction of new elements at the right level here of our nested hierarchy should not break existing implementations. In fact, your code can keep humming away completely ignorant of the fact that this new data is there. Or if you so choose, you can take advantage advantage of it. Now with that said, there's this notion in the world of XML of validation whereby you can say a priori this XML document in order to be valid must adhere to this very specific specification and if that specification says you must have a first name, you must have a last name, you must have an initial and so forth, this document if it were, uh, were missing any of those items would maybe not be considered valid, but that itself is a design decision, um, whether or not to validate your data in that way. All right, so let's try to pick up a more realistic example than this contrived um, uh, purchase order of sorts, and let's do something that's maybe just as contrived, but at least illustrates some of the different features of XML that we can start to take advantage of, and you can certainly do so in Project Zero. So this is a database, if you will, implemented in XML that happens to represent a database of students. And so perhaps somewhat intuitively, but arbitrarily, I've decided that the root element of this XML document will be called students. Um, it's worth noting at this point, if it's not already apparent, just like in the world of HTML, you have one HTML element inside of which is everything else. Um, same deal in XML. You can have one and only one root element, one top level element inside of which everything else must be. And yet I seem to be violating that here. There are two lines of text above my student's element. Um, anyone know already the, the jargon we can slap on those two lines? They are not, in fact, elements. So one's a comment, right? You've probably seen it from HTML. So this uh, second line here, open bracket, bang, uh, dash, dash, that's a comment. And then you see almost the opposite of it at the other end. So XML supports comments. These are meant to be for the human's benefit. In this case, we're just describing what the, uh, what the file is for the human's sake. Um, and then that thing at the top, anyone know what that thing is called? You see it in some web pages these days, too. So um, not quite. It's related um, in spirit, but this is called the XML declaration. And where a document type plays a slightly different role, and it's frankly a lot harder to remember, as you probably have seen by making your own pages, the XML declaration really just says, this is an XML document. This is such and such version of XML. Right now we're still on 1.0. Um, and here is the encoding type for this document. If it's UTF-8, if it's something simpler, um, the UTF-8 thing is increasingly necessary to be mindful of. If you're incorporating data from different sources. For instance, the events calendar takes in data from all different places. And we have to be mindful, is this coming in as UTF-8? Is it coming in as 7 or 8-bit ASCII? Because we might render characters wrong if we misinterpret the data. So thankfully, with XML, you can specify the contents are in such and such a format. So um, it is optional, though. As an aside, um, generally, this is not necessary to include. And in fact, in the world of PHP, it's actually a little tricky to include this in your web pages. Why? So the question marks, right? So we, we've talked about in PHP, and to enable PHP mode, you go open bracket, question mark, PHP. Or if you have a certain feature enabled, short open tags, you can just do open bracket, question mark. Unfortunately, um, PHP, if it sees that, 
it's going to mistake it. Um, now, there was actually a post on one of our several uh, Google groups last night about PHP 6. As best I can tell, I read up on php.net last night and some of their official blogs and slides. It does seem to be the case that short open tags are trying to be deprecated in the next version of PHP, or version 6. Um, you can actually see this in version 5.3. We undid this change on the cloud, but if you installed uh, XAMPP or XAMPP yourself or WAMP or any of these, you probably noticed that short open tags were off by default, which is their way of trying to coax the world to this. Frankly, I think this is unfortunate because I think this, I am among those people on the internet who thinks this looks ridiculous and having to type this every time I want to write a PHP instruction drives me nuts. Um, so, but it seems to not be a foregone conclusion whether or not they'll be removed altogether. That does not actually seem to be the case, but I couldn't get perfect confirmation of that online. Um, but this is just problematic. Um, so right now, um, any thoughts on to how you can include a document, uh, sorry, an XML declaration in your PHP code without confusing the parser? Yeah, you have to do stupid things. Now, it's, it's unfortunate. It's frankly only one line of code. So frankly, I don't think it's reason enough to rip the feature out of the language. But what most people would do is something like echo, single quote, open bracket, question mark, XML, and then dot, 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 semicolon. You just print it out as a line of text at the top of the file. It's a bit of a hack, but it does solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, not built in, I don't believe. 5.3 might have something new because they keep adding to the kitchen sink, but not that I'm aware of. So, all right. So let's try and tease apart some of the useful features of this. And just before we dive in, notice some curiosities. One, here's an empty element. So the context here might be the student just hasn't been assigned to a dorm yet. So that's really just a placeholder. Uh, let's see, a C data section. Anyone know what C data stands for? Yeah. Yeah, character data. So this is actually germane even in the world of just web design these days. If you're writing JavaScript or CSS or just other characters in a document, um, it's generally helpful or a good thing, and we'll discuss this more specifically later in the term when we get to JavaScript, but to put all of your JavaScript code, if it's in a web page itself and not in a separate JS file, to surround it with this crazy looking syntax, open bracket, bang, open bracket, C data, open bracket, and then bracket, bracket, bracket at the very end. What this tells the browser, or more generally the XML parser, is that here comes some text. I know that there's some scary looking stuff in here, including open brackets and ampersands and characters that generally tend to break XML, as we'll see tonight. You know what? Just read them all in blindly. Don't try to validate or parse it. Just read it in. Take it on faith that I know what I'm doing and just hand me the whole chunk of text ultimately. So this is actually useful if you're writing things like JavaScript and need to, as we'll see, do simple things. Like if x is less than y, well, unfortunately, this is a scary character in the world of web pages because it demarks also the start of a tag. So this can confuse a lot of browsers. So we'll see that C data is a way of proactively saying, don't worry, this is OK. Um, I know what I'm doing by including these characters here. But it's a feature of XML itself. So some of the uh, tidbits here. Are, um, so one, that excerpt at top right there is the so-called XML declaration. If it appears, it must be at the very start of your file, and it must start at the very first character. You cannot accidentally hit Enter. You can't accidentally hit the space bar. Stupid little mistakes will trip up the parser. Um, and by parser, for those unfamiliar, I mean the browser. I mean the PHP code. We're going to start writing any program that's reading in the XML file. So the reason for this is because that line of code, as the encoding attribute suggests, is often used by parsers to infer or to detect what the encoding is of the rest of the file. And so if you don't start off right off the bat telling the parser what kind of encoding is being used, it won't know. It will assume something like a default, like ask your UTF something. Um, and so for those um, more, uh, less or more familiar, there's various encoding schemes here. This essentially means what patterns of bits are used to represent different characters. Um, for a lot of English um, spoken words and sentences, not such a big deal, UTF-8, ASCII, or so forth. But especially for a lot of Asian languages, for special symbology, um, interesting characters. Um, you need more than seven or eight bits in ASCII allowed, and so you have these other systems. And so there's um, nice support for this built into XML. You just have to know which one to choose. Um, with elements, we have a few uh, important details. So 
One, XML really boils down to elements. You don't really need any of the other stuff if you have elements, because the root element is all you need to make a valid XML document.、Um, start tag, pretty much statement of the obvious there. This is the only detail. The slightly annoying, but you cannot have elements that, whose names start with a number.、Um, we don't need it that often, but this is one of those stupid details you trip over eventually.、Um, generally, start with a number. Of, <laughs> Start with a letter or an underscore, and then just not weird punctuation or anything like that. If you keep them pretty much alphabetical, you'll be fine.、Um, but there is the formal definition if you need to tuck that away.、Um, so, what can you put inside of elements? And what is the jargon with which to be familiar? So, there's essentially four approaches you can take to using an XML element in a document. So, one, an element can contain another element. So, this is what the world calls element content. If you've got an element called student, that student might have a status child associated with it. So, we say that student has just element content. Yes, some white space, but it turns out one feature of a lot of XML parsers is you can tell it. Or by default, it will assume that you really don't care about white space that's outside of elements. So, even though I was very nitpickily pointing out the backslash n and the backslash t, nine times out of ten,、um, applications don't care. They ignore it. But it's worth being mindful of for the one out of ten that do. So, you can also have parsed character data or PC data. This is just text. So, text that does not contain crazy characters like open brackets or ampersands. It's just some piece of text like the name Jim Bob. You can have mixed content where you actually co mingle. Uh, elements with text and with other element children. So, this is a bit of a contrived example here Jim J. Bob, where I've semantically tagged his middle initial. We can come up with cleaner ways of doing this using a first name element and a last name. But you certainly see this in the familiar world of web pages. Certainly, have you probably done something like a paragraph tag before, inside of which is hi, comma, let's say open bracket i, David. Just to come up with something arbitrary. So there, backslash p. So here is mixed content. We've got some text, hi, comma. We've got more text, David, but inside of that, we also have mixed content as well. So in this case here, we can have the two co mingled.、Um, and finally, you can have no content. There is no child or attributes on dorm, so that has. No content. Where is this relevant? Well, if you get to the point of implementing what are called DTDs or XML schemas, it's these kinds of models that you need to keep in mind when deciding what you want your XML to look like or what you can promise that, say, a third party, Amazon or the like, can expect in the way of data from you. You can specify down to this level of detail exactly what can contain what. As for attributes, this too, pretty much、um, probably. Uh, familiar intuitively. There are some restrictions on the name, pretty much keep it reasonable. Don't start with numbers.、Um, the values, they have to be quoted. You can have single and double quotes, but you have to make sure that the outermost ones、uh, are consistent and the innermost ones don't confuse the parser. So, pretty much, you could do something like match equals quote unquote item equals quote unquote baseball bat, so long as you take care not to commingle quotes.、Um, and finally, the most important thing. Cannot have those in attributes. So, what do you end up doing if you desperately need to have an open bracket inside of an attribute? Yeah, you have to escape it. So, how do you escape something like an open bracket?、Uh, not backslash in XML. So, nine times out of ten, it is the answer. But in XML, you do. Yeah, so this is the less than symbol. So there are these things called XML or HTML entities, which start with ampersand. They then are a、uh, symbolic name, like LT for less than. They can also be、uh, numbered entities. So for instance, there's only a couple that I actually remember because they're useful sometimes. If you do、uh, ampersand, hash mark, 8211, semicolon, this is what the world calls an end dash. Which is like kind of slightly longer than a hyphen. And then I remember 8212 is an M dash, which is even longer. So, in short, there are hundreds of XML or HTML entities that pretty much map to the corresponding Unicode、uh, characters. So, 65 is A, 97 is little a, and, and many, many others exist. 8211 is M dash.、Um, they're numeric codes that allow you to embed in a web page some symbol that either can't be expressed safely, like this. Or can't be expressed with any key I know of on my keyboard. So,、um, in the world of Microsoft Word, you go to insert symbol. Well, in the world of HTML or, XHTML or, of, or of XML, 
you insert them more deliberately like this. And how about ampersand? How do you get a literal ampersand in an XML document? Yeah, this is the only one that will annoy you at some point. If you go on to do quite a bit of web development and you're trying to make sure your web pages validate, um, you have to replace every ampersand with this crazy sequence, which isn't often that bad, but very often do ampersands appear in what very popular feature of the internet, or I don't know how to say this without giving it away. URLs, right? It's really common to have web pages with a href equals quote unquote with really long URLs, which may very well have lots and lots of ampersands. So one of the nuisances, frankly, of XHTML, if you're trying to get it to validate using the W3C's validator, which we've pushed you for, to uh, for Project Zero, you have to escape every damn ampersand in that URL just to get it to validate. So there's some details in this world where people around a conference table decided this is acceptable or just didn't realize how annoying this would be, but that's really where you trip over details like this. So tuck that one away, if, if you will. So PC data. So can't reference it. OK, so that's pretty much a statement of what we've said already. Uh, PC data is text. Entities. So it turns out in XML, you only get five for free. And one of the most popular non-breaking space is not one of them. So technically, if you are implementing um, an XML document, you might be inclined to use ampersand NBSP for a piece of white space, but it's not legit unless you actually define it. Um, for our purposes, probably it won't really come up, but know for now that the only ones that are legitimate in XML are this for ampersand, less than, greater than, just for good measure, this one here, apostrophe, so single quote and double quotes. So those are useful if you really want to embed a whole bunch of quotes inside of like a value string with surrounded by quotes. You can include those there. Um, thankfully, PHP in particular makes it really nice to interact with HTML, going to text, going back and forth. Um, HTML special chars is one function that I think I mentioned last time in the context of protecting your website against uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Um, you can make sure that people aren't inserting bogus data, uh, inserting actual HTML into your site by converting anything potentially dangerous to their entity equivalents. And so, for instance, functions in PHP can do all of this conversion for you. But these are just the few that are useful to know because they come up so frequently. Um, as an aside, if you're curious, you don't really have to know, uh, uh, get into this for Project Zero, but maybe as a later in life, you can define your own entities, your own shortcuts, your own constants, in a sense, for XML files. So for instance, if I want to implement the thing I know as NBSP, this is the syntax in XML for declaring an entity called NBSP that is a synonym now for this sequence. So uh, ampersand sharp 160 semicolon is the numeric code for um, the thing we, some of us know as the non-breaking space. And just to see some of these, I frankly, um, I never remember most of these, um, but one that's really useful that like Google has started using a lot so that you can avoid using images as much as possible to avoid wasting bytes and HTTP hits. So next to each of the calendars on this site we looked at a moment ago, there are these little down arrows. That's actually just an uh, XML entity that represents a downward pointing triangle. And when you click on it, a little drop down menu appears. And frankly, you do Unicode uh, entity triangle and you'll find all, oh, it's Google's birthday today maybe. Maybe top left there. Um, you'll see that the world has defined all sorts of entities. I have no idea why you'd ever use these, for instance, sort of like Mac Paint 1990s. But you have all sorts of characters at your disposal. So it's all very much related to this kind of stuff that you might be familiar with. All right, any questions on some of the basic syntactic details of XML? Yeah. Oh, good question. It's actually quite easy. Sorry to gloss over that. Let me go back here to where we were, geometric shapes. So generally, um, you'll see this here. So this is the numeric code, 9649. So we would do ampersand number 9649, semicolon. So you insert those numbers in between uh, the sh uh, pound sign and the semicolon. Sometimes you'll see them given in hexadecimal form. And I don't want to get this wrong. Does it, uh, ampersand? Let me double check. You put the x in there somewhere, but I forget where it goes in the context of entities. Unless, do you not recall? No, no, I guess so. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll get back to you. Oh, did I get it right on the? Uh, 
Oh, yes, perfect. OK, perfect example. So here is the entity for the copyright symbol. And indeed, if you use the hexadecimal form, you just put a little x. Not zero x as is commonly the convention, but just an x, then the number. Good catch. Yeah? So are these entities supported in like every font family? Like sometimes you know you declare a font family, a serif, a sans serif, whatever. So if there's all these characters out there, does a font designer implement these characters? Good question. Short answer, no. I'm sure all of these characters are not implemented in that way. I'm going to hypothesize that what the browsers do is they make sure to use a standard font for at least the symbology aspect of things, um, much like even Microsoft Word uses the symbol font to give you a certain character set. Um, so you can use these without worrying that it's not going to be represented. If you're using some font, you don't have to worry. I think so, with high, with high probability, certainly. Now, now that the world is introducing web fonts and the like with more powerful CSS tricks, that might change my answer. But um, from experience, I've, and using a standard web font in CSS, I've never had a problem um, with any of the entities. That's not a proof by any means, but um, I think it's uh, reassurance that the browser figures out which one to use as needed. Other questions? All right, so just a couple other features here. So C data, um, just to reiterate more formally, allows you to include potentially dangerous symbols, um, or as we'll see, JavaScript or more innocuous stuff that just might so happen to have things like a less than sign in the context of a condition or a mathematical expression. Um, it allows you to include, though, also things like uh, HTML in your XML document. So partly by poor design with the course's website, there's a couple of files where we realized, ooh, we'd really like to include some uh, HTML in our configuration files with which to generate the pages that you see when visiting cs75.net. The example that comes to mind is the software page where, um, at least in a previous version, we realized we wanted to have some additional hyperlinks embedded on the web page. Um, and we didn't really think of that in advance. So we realized, well, frankly, the path of least resistance here is to put any HTML we want to show up on the web page in a C data section so that it gets passed through literally. Because by contrast, as we'll look at in a bit, if you were to include HTML inside of an XML configuration document, well, when you parse that document or use any of the PHP functions we'll play with today on that document, you won't get back your XML. You'll instead get back this in-memory representation of it. You won't get the string that you actually want to put in your web page unless you put it in one of these C data sections. Um, and comments. Um, comments were actually not designed all that well, unlike some languages where you can nest comments as needed, which can be useful when commenting blocks of stuff in and out. Um, once you have open bracket bang hyphen hyphen, you cannot have this sequence of characters again um, until you actually close the comment, which isn't a huge problem for short comments. But sometimes if you're using comments to comment out big chunks of XML in a document for whatever reason, frankly, we do this all the time with the course website's config files where we know next week what the thing's going to look like, but we don't want to show you week four just yet. And so we comment out that chunk of code. Well, you run into silly things like this because you can't have hyphen hyphen appear um, inside. So why don't we take a five minute break? When we come back, we'll dive into PHP and some actual coding. OK, so a couple words on project one before we forge ahead with some PHP code with XML. Um, so you may recall from poking around your accounts that when we created your uh, home directories, we pre-populated them with some standard directories. Really, there's only one that's particularly important. The rest, you're welcome to exercise some design discretion. But when you log into cloud.cs75.net, uh, as yourself via SSH, if familiar, or via SFTP, as you may have done. Uh, if still not quite comfortable with those processes, definitely catch me or Alex or um, Sid or Dan at some point via email or attend one of the sections where we can walk through this in more detail. But when you log in, you'll find yourself in your home directory, which is generally referred to as tilde. Inside of your home directory is a subdirectory called projects that we created for you. Presumably at this point, you know that there is also a zero subdirectory inside of that. And inside of that is an HTML directory. So a word on this structure. Um, so one, 
Um, the common convention when just making a home page these days is to have a subdirectory called public underscore HTML or web or HTML or htdocs. There's a bunch of, stand, a bunch of conventions, um, but what we chose, because we're doing virtual hosting for you all, whereby you each have a subdomain that you've mapped by a CNAME record to our server, we wanted to make sure that we standardized exactly the path in which all of your projects lived. Um, and now, and you'll begin to appreciate this a bit more for project one, we also wanted to make sure that for each project, Project, you had a folder like 0 or 1 or 2 where you could put all of your files, but we wanted to make sure that there was one level deeper of hierarchy there so that all of your web accessible content, CSS, JavaScript, .php files, all live in this HTML directory as they will for project 1. But it's very common as you'll see and, and discover that if you want to have uh, configuration files like config.php or in the context of project one, uh, menu.xml, where you want your code to be able to access those files, but you don't want anyone on the internet to be able to just visit the file name in a URL and see that particular file. Well, you could use various tricks at the Apache level and restrict access to certain files. You could give those files different file extensions. You could change permissions, perhaps. But in general, the safest approach as a matter of best practice is if you don't want it on the internet, don't put it in a folder that's accessible on the internet. Despite any other mechanisms you might want to put in place, it's just too easy to screw up or to forget about the, this, uh, the, the forget about where things are and accidentally disable PHP. All of a sudden, everyone can see all of your PHP content by visiting those files. So, in the interest of preaching. Uh, what we practice, what we decided to do is pre-create not only an HTML directory, but also a subdirectory called lib, which generally denotes library, uh, and another called etsy for etc., which generally refers to configuration files and such. You're welcome to stray from this. We don't mean to mandate certain names for all of these directories. If you have habits, you're welcome to keep them. But the one you can't change because it's an Apache configuration detail is this one. Any web accessible content must live in here. But as Project One's PDF explains, only those files that you want to be accessible via a URL on the internet should live in here. If you've got any helper functions that you might implement in other files, uh, any uh, global constants for database parameters for Project 2 onward, those should not live in this directory. They should live in Etsy, most likely. Or really, the convention that we're uh, suggesting is in Etsy goes configuration details. In lib goes helper functions or third-party libraries that you might use in PHP. Meanwhile, in HTML, though, should go anything that needs to be internet accessible. So if you use something like jQuery, a popular library that we'll talk, discuss a bit later in the semester, it should go in here in HTML because it's got to be web accessible for the browser to access it. But if you use other library code or your own library code, it can go in here. But if you're um, not quite comfortable with this layout, um, you can pick your own convention so long as you do adhere to the best practice for security. So we can create folders. Absolutely. So the, the spec says for project one, everything you write for this project must be in the one subdirectory deeper. Um, and the only convention you must follow is the HTML one. You can decide on your own names. Include is another popular directory name or organize however you're comfortable. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah? No, I'm confused. Uh-oh. It seems to me you put those at the same level as HTML or the one? Correct. Right. So is it just not a good practice to make a folder off of HTML and then change the Oh, what do you mean by a folder off of HTML? A subdirectory. Oh. Uh, so you could, but I would argue that's what we've done. It's just what you're calling HTML, I'm calling one. And what you're calling the other directory, I'm calling HTML. Yes? No, I'm just trying to grasp what the last question um, So we can create folders. At what level can we create? You can create folders anywhere in the pro in the one subdirectory on deeper. Um, the only requirement is you can't change the name of the HTML one. So the idea here is, yes, they're all at the same level. But the way Apache works is we have told Apache in the, in the vhost configuration section that we glanced at uh, two or so lectures ago, looks kind of like XML, that fragment we had on the board. We've told Apache that when you visit projects.davidmalin.com, that domain should map specifically to this path here. It doesn't allow it to access here or here. So the neat thing is, um, in PHP, 
if you haven't seen in section already, you soon will, you can call a function called require or another function called include, whereby you can include one PHP file on another. You can do this in a lot of languages. Java has the import statement. C++ has the include mechanism and all of this. So same idea in PHP. So if you have something called, for instance, index.php, as you probably will in your HTML folder, and suppose you have a file in lib called helpers, Dot .php, and the point of this file is just to have a bunch of functions you wrote that you want to be accessible all over the place, so you wanted to put them in one place. Well, if you want to be able to access content in this file, functions in this file from this file, they're in different subdirectories. But what you can very easily do is in index.php, you can use this function called require or include whose parameter is the name of a file you want to include. And the simplest approach, frankly, if I'm in, inside of index.php, I can say require something that's one level back slash in lib slash in helpers.php. So because I am the author of this file on the web server, I am allowed to navigate dot dot and even dot dot slash dot dot and even dot dot slash dot dot. I can go anywhere I want on the file system that I have access to. But Apache will not let anyone put dot dot in the URL and get any higher up than the HTML subdirectory. So as a matter of security, because we've imposed at the Apache level that this is the publicly accessible directory for the project one, um, you can put anything that you want at the same level. Apache will not let the user do this. You can do this in PHP code. The user cannot do this in URLs. Yeah? Sorry, one more question. Uh -huh. um, so right now, if you go to, let's say, projects.mycoding.com, mm -hmm. Correct. Are you guys changing? We did. So that when the next one becomes available, it'll automatically flip? Oh, no. So we, we didn't do that. We only did that as a special case because we felt if you've just bought this new domain, it's called projects.mydomain.com, and you wanted to show the world the web page you made, it'd be pretty lame to have them go to slash zero. Um, so, but for standardization's sake, so we know where everything is, we made sure it lives at slash zero, but we also, as an illusion, made it live in the root directory too. Um, we're actually using one more trick that we didn't see in the httpd.conf file from a while back, whereby there's another module in Apache called alias, mod alias, whereby you can alias certain URLs to certain directories. And we did this deliberately so that, um, and without going into too much detail. I wouldn't try recreating this on your own Apache setup just yet until you've done one of the projects and get comfortable with the structure. What we wanted to make sure that happened was in your URLs, we wanted students to be able to visit slash zero, slash one, slash two, slash three. But we didn't want that to mean that you have to put all of your files in the same directory because that would violate this matter of best practice, keeping things at different levels. And so what we're really doing is even though it looks like one slash HTML, two slash HTML, three slash HTML, we're essentially stripping this out from the URL just to keep the URLs a little prettier. And we're, we can circulate the, co uh, the configuration that we're doing to, uh, using to do this. It's one line of code. Um, but the implication is that um, zero happens to live in two places by design. But we're not going to change that. That's your project one. That's, That's where it's going to be. Okay. We're not going to put it anywhere else. But we're going to have to put that in the URL. The, uh, and let's use all relative URLs, in which case it shouldn't be an issue. In fact, which is also a matter of best practice. You should not be hard coding paths if, if avoidable. It'll just make things more portable, especially if you're developing on your machine and then moving to the cloud anyway. All right, so turns out that PHP comes with a feature called simple XML. And it is actually quite simple. With just a couple of functions, can we grab XML files, iterate over them, top to bottom, left to right, and then start doing something with the data that we find? Um, the one downside of simple XML is that sometimes it's too simple. And it doesn't quite do as much as you'd like. So if you find yourself just trying to compel it to do something that doesn't feel natural. There are more sophisticated libraries. One of them is called the PHP DOM library. But frankly, the beauty of this thing is its simplicity. And nine times out of 10, um, it, can do, um, it can get the job done. So let's pick 
one such job. So I'm going to go into a file we looked at last week. Um, on the course's website, we happen to have an XML directory where we keep all of our configuration files for the website. And we looked at this snippet last week, which was our arbitrarily formatted lectures.xml file. I say arbitrary because there's no standard out there that tells me what a lecture has to look like. We just came up with something that worked for us. And so we have a lectures element at the very top. We have the XML declaration. It doesn't really matter in this context. Doesn't, uh, could have deleted it. Um, but uh, really no downside to having it. Notice that we chose a lecture element as the first child. It's got a number attribute, a title child, dates child, resources child, and so forth. But one of the first questions you'll have to ask yourself with project one is element or attribute, right? Notice here I seem to have, for some reason, made zero and specifically number an attribute as opposed to a child. So one question, could I have made number a child element? and just written instead something like open bracket number, zero, close number. Could I have done that? Yeah. Short answer, yes. Nothing wrong with it. OK? Should I have? Or why didn't I? Thoughts? Because the number is associated with the lecture. So the number is associated with the lecture, but you know, so is that date. Uh, and so are those resources. And so is that title. So let me push back. Yeah. Is it kind of like a primary key? Or? Yeah, so primary key. So we'll discuss this for those unfamiliar, but there's this notion of primary keys in the world of databases, which is a value that uniquely identifies some record in a database or some element in an XML uh, document. So yeah, I like that one. So this number is meant to uniquely identify this particular lecture, um, both semantically and structurally in this document. So that's, that's good. Um, but you know, OK, but doesn't this convey exactly the same information? Other thoughts? Yeah? Could they use it to set a high watermark? To set a high water? Watermark to give it a number so you can query a check. Ah, OK. So that's actually quite good. Um, so let me interpret what you're saying and push back if this is not what you meant. Um, syntactically, as we'll see with this particular API, you're going to access attributes in a different way than you would access child elements. And frankly, with a lot of libraries, especially Java, frankly, which we don't cover in this course, but has XML support, um, it, some languages and libraries, it's just much easier to get at attributes than it is to get at child elements. So if you know this is a piece of data you're going to want frequently and you'd ideally like to get at it easily, making something as an attribute actually in the real world has has some compelling features. Did I put too many words in your? Yeah. Excellent point then. What's that? Does it make it more dynamic? Not necessarily. Because at the end of the day, you can almost do the same thing with attributes as you can with child elements. But there's one key detail that I'll try to coax us toward here that distinguishes them. Partly, because, uh, is, is there something about attributes that makes them easier to access in these APIs? Partly. Um, long story short, one of the most popular uh, types of parsers, programs that read XML, is what's called a SAX parser, simple API for XML, S-A-X. Um, this parser's pr purpose in life is to literally read a file, top to bottom, left to right, and then trigger an event for every tag that it encounters. The implication is the moment you see the name of an element, you also have access to its attributes. Whereas if you want to access a child element, you have to wait a little longer before the parser gets to that point. So that, in a nutshell, is why it's often easier to get at the attributes. They're just closer to the name of the element. But there's one other, and there was this OK, so that seems to be a difference. So here we have a numeric value for this attribute called number, whereas in the past our child elements have been uh, alphabetical. Um, I'll push back and say mostly a coincidence here. So good observation, but mostly just a coincidence. Yeah? Higher up in the hierarchy. Higher up in the hierarchy. OK, in what sense? Well, you said the whole thing is a hierarchy of where you know, children go farther down. OK. OK, so definitely quicker access, at least with some languages. It is higher up. And that's actually not bad. Just conceptually, the, the first 
thing that the characterizes a lecture, at least so far as the syllabus is concerned, is frankly its number. And then beneath that generally is the dates and the titles and all of this other metadata associated with the lecture. So just conceptually, it kind of is very reasonable to put the number at sort of the highest point possible with this element. And there's one other detail that I'll try to lead us toward. Yeah. Ah, there it is. OK, and this is the one that really influences design at the end of the day. All of what we just discussed, frankly, is right. There's no uh, right or wrong answer. So all of these were points um, to be made. And frankly, every time I push back, doesn't mean they were bad. It's just um, the most compelling one is probably this one, whereby um, attributes, by nature of their structure, cannot be extended. Attributes can't have child attributes. They can't have further nesting or hierarchy, right? Because the buck kind of stops there. Number equals quote unquote something. There's no opportunity to nest anything inside of that further like you can with an element. So, really, the design question to ask yourselves with project one and the pizzeria menu is is it reasonable at some point for me to want to make this piece of data extensible? Uh, for instance, might the pizzeria come back in time and say, you know what, we'd really like to start selling medium pizzas. Well, if you implemented something as an attribute, would you be able to support that? By contrast, if you implemented it as a child element, could you support that? So you want to exercise some forethought too. And certainly it's impossible to surmise every possible request they might make. But there's probably some low-hanging fruit there to ask yourselves, like medium pizzas. Or what if they want to add a new topping and you don't want to paint yourself into a corner? Now, with something like this, the number, I mean, a number is a number, right? There is no semantic distinction that I can make inside of that number like I could my name, which has a first component, a last, and a middle. A number is a number. So frankly, it just kind of works to make it an attribute. And silly though it sounds, it's such a short piece of data, just aesthetically, it fits nicely on that line. Um, you could argue that um, suppose a lecture had a description uh, associated with a sentence or a paragraph. Well, frankly, I might not tease apart a description all that much more. I'm not going to tag it with first name, last name, or crazy stuff like that. So I could put a whole sentence or paragraph in an attribute. But then at that point, it just gets a little unwieldy. So some of these are just rules of thumb. They're nothing technical. But this extensibility question is important because you don't want to make something an attribute if you like name. If you think in the future, you might actually want to tease apart first, middle, and last name. So you just answered it. So the takeaway oh. is if you want to make something extensible, it should be an element. Uh, if you want to make something extensible, it should be an element. Yes. That or, frankly, sometimes the aesthetics can govern. If you just want a very simple file that doesn't use attributes, it's just purely elemental, that is itself a reasonable decision. There's nothing wrong with doing this approach if that's just the approach you prefer. Yeah. If you were to build a tool to validate that you hadn't used number one twice or something, would there be value in using it as an attribute as opposed to an element? So that is true. Um, so it's more detailed than we'll spend much time on in this course. But yes, this matter of DTDs and XML schemas actually allows you to specify different data types for pieces of an XML document. And there are certain data types include, there's not that many in DTDs. There's something called an NM token, a name token. So when we've been discussing what an attribute name can be, what uh, element name can be, we're actually talking about a data type called this, name token. Uh, there's another data type called ID, which by de definition of XML must be unique in a document. So yes, if you're trying to impose some rigor on a document and third parties who are reading it, you can specify that the number field is an ID field. And therefore, it is an error to contain two lecture elements or two elements of any name with the same ID value. And the XML parser itself is responsible for enforcing that constraint. And what it will do is essentially return false if given a file that uh, violates that condition. You can also have a data type called ID ref in XML. Again, more detail than you'll be then you'll need to play with for this project. Really, just the basics are plenty sufficient since it's mostly new. Um, ID ref, by contrast, is a data type whose value must refer to an, a value that was defined as an ID for some other element. So you get that level of control as well. And this thing called XML schema, which is far more sophisticated and powerful uh, than XML DTD, um, contains these and more. Frankly, in XML schema, there are 41 data types, if you thought like, six or eight in most languages is a lot. You have non-negative integer, positive integer, every possible permutation of things they have in that language. XML is known for its verboseness. OK, other questions? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a philosophical question. Do you think that um, the people that developed XML intended for attributes to be more inherently leafy and for the elements to be kind of branchy in the tree? 
Yeah, that's actually, so that, yeah, in fact, what a perfect segue to my picture here. Um, so in, in short, yes, we'll double back to the code in just a moment. But if we consider this smaller XML fragment at top left here, which represents a uh, student element who's got one child element called student as uh, nested inside, the way I've chosen by convention here, which is not at all uncommon, is to represent this XML fragment or document as a DOM, D-O-M, document object model, which is a term we'll revisit in our uh, JavaScript uh, time later in the semester. I need to have a root node, which, as an uh, annoying curiosity, is not the same as the root element. Because recall that you can have comments atop a file. There's this other thing called a processing instruction, which we've not looked at in XML, um, that can also be outside the root element. So you need an uber node off which to hang all of those things. So focus your eyes for just a moment on the student's element right here. This is the root element of the document. And just as I've depicted pictorially here, its child is student. And hanging off of it laterally in a leafy way, as you say, um, would be its ID attribute. Whereas it branches off downward to contain these children. And just to be super proper, notice that I've made children of student include, let's see, some white space, backslash n, backslash t. That's right there. Then the name. Then another backslash n in two tabs for the further indentation for status. Then status itself. Then more white space and so forth. But this is just an artist's rendition of a DOM. But in reality, if you were to implement an XML parser that loads a document into memory and uses sort of a data structures 101 type approach to implementing it, odds are you would create a tree-like structure in memory that looks a lot like this. I'm assuming you can minify XML the way you can with JavaScript and stuff? Uh, in the sense of stripping out what, white space? White space. Yeah, so the, the word de jour for XML is to normalize the DOM, which means to uh, collapse all contiguous white space into single nodes. Um, the elimination of white space is a function of the, valid, the val validity checking of the parser. It's not quite the same as um, uh, just normalizing it. OK, so let's actually do something with this. So here's a file. Here's an XML file. And I would really like to make my own version of the CS75 lecture page, just so I can go through some of the motions of writing some code here. And then we'll perhaps pluck off something else um, that's more industry standard than uh, course specific. So let me go ahead and first make a copy of lectures.xml. I'm going to put it into today's lecture directory for now. I'll probably clean it up later to eliminate some of the commented out stuff, which are currently just a distraction. All right, so public HTML, lectures, and third source directory. OK, so I have lectures.xml. And just let me make mental note, lectures is the root, lecture is the child, then title, dates, resources. And then we have the resources we discussed last week in some detail, which have one or more formats each. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Let me go ahead and write a page called uh, lectures.php. I'm going to go ahead and open my PHP code. And let's say, um, rather, for time's sake, rather than go through the whole doc, actually, let's say, maybe I can cheat. Source uh, home.php, lectures.php. I'm going to let me steal some code so I don't have to remember the whole document type declaration here. All right, so open lectures.php, get rid of this. All right, home. Let's say I call this lectures. Let's call this lectures. OK, so now I just have a little placeholder for my code. All right, stole last week's and started with this. So here I want to add a page that just dynamically opens up this, P, uh, this XML file, iterates over the elements, and prints out things that might be of interest to me. So let's start simple. I'm going to go ahead, and I could do this in a number of ways, but perhaps as a matter of good practice for now, I'll keep everything self-contained, but put my logic, my business logic, up top just to keep things a little clean until I get to the presentation of this data. So it turns out I can do something like this. So um, I'm going to call this DOM for my tree, um, is going to get the result of calling simple XML load file. Unfortunately, PHP is not known for its succinctness with function names. Um, until um, now-ish, there's really no notion of namespaces and features common to other languages. So you get this abhorrent convention of having really long function names with underscores uh, indicating what type of function they are, simple XML being some. We'll see some for MySQL. Uh, with a underscore as well. But for now, we'll just take what we're given. So do lectures.xml. What's really nice about this and why I often refer to PHP as having the kitchen sink, that's it. 
That one line of code opens the XML file, uh, parses it top to bottom, left to right. If it is indeed well formatted XML, it hands me back a tree structure that looks a whole lot like this, albeit specific to this specific lectures.xml file. So this is nice. I don't have to write much code at all. Now I can simply traverse this DOM as I see fit. So that's all I'm going to do at that top level because now I'm going to move into the presentation of this data. And let's see, what can I do? I'm going to go ahead and do the simplest thing possible. Then we'll clean it up. I'm going to enter PHP mode for a moment. And I'm going to use a for each construct. So one of the most useful syntactic structures in PHP is the for each construct, because it allows you to iterate over all of the elements of an, uh, uh, of an associative array or numerically indexed array uh, in this fashion. For each, let's start at the top of the tree. Now I want to take a step down for each lecture that's inside of that tree. Uh, let me go ahead and call that on each iteration lecture. So this for each construct is going to iterate over every lecture element in the DOM. And on each iteration of this loop, it's going to store that current element in a variable called dollar sign lecture. That's all. So let's see, what do I want to print? Well, let's start with the title. Let's start with the numbers and the titles. So let's do the titles first. So title is an attribute or a child of each lecture element. Do you recall? So it's a child. If you don't recall, well, the only attribute we had was the number. Everything else was a child. So it turns out I can use the same notation. I can do something like this. So print uh, lecture. Let's take another step. So that's the arrow notation in PHP. Print the title. And then close bracket. And then just to keep this clean, I'll fix this up in a bit. I'm going to go ahead and print out in XHTML form a BR tag. It's not going to be pretty, but let's just print out a list of these titles now. I'm going to save the file. All right, I'm going to go over to a browser, uh, cs75.net, lectures, three, source, and this is lectures.php. And I have a problem. So what's the first thing I should check here? It says 403 forbidden. All right, permission. So what should my PHP file be chmodded, or uh, what permission should it have? So it actually doesn't need execute, um, which is a curiosity of SUPHP. It need, because this is an interpreted language, it doesn't need to be executable. The interpreter needs to be executable. My file just needs to be readable by me. And in fact, it probably is by default because I'm reading it now. But let's do a sanity check. On a Linux system, you can do ls-l and then the name of the file. You'll see a whole bunch of output, including your username, the date you last modified it, and then on the far left, a bunch of hyphens and rwx symbols. Re R means readable, w means writable, and the fact that the leftmost uh, uh, hyphens have r and w mean I can read and write it. Though frankly, I pretty much knew that because I've been creating the file with us. So it must not be the file that's in got wrong permissions. So the directory. So I'm going to go ahead and do ls-l on the whole directory. I've got, uh, let's see, ls-al for all. And notice here's the problem. There's some other files from last week in there. But notice at the very top, dot refers to my current directory. It's a directory, as indicated by the D at top left. RWX means I can read this directory, write to it, execute it, which means enter it, uh, like open it. But then all those other hyphens mean what? Nobody else. Nobody else can. So there's a few ways to fix this. You might have seen some in section already. I'm going to do chmod, which is change mode, A for all, plus X for executability on dot, enter, ls-la again. And now I see what? I've given everyone in the world executability for that directory. And executability, again, means the ability to step into it or to open it. Doesn't mean they can see the contents, but they can move into the directory. And if they know the name of something there, it's OK. So let's go ahead and actually try reloading now. Still a problem. So let's see if it's not that. It must not be the source directory that's the issue, but Maybe dot dot, right? It could be chmod a plus x of dot dot, the parent directory, which is the thing called, which directory is my parent at the moment? So you'll see on the cloud, too, in parentheses, we tell you where you are in your account. So I'm in my public HTML directory, which is unique to the course account, in my lectures directory in three, which is relative to me dot dot. So let's hit enter there. Let's go back over here and reload. Aha, OK, we fixed it. So I just needed to allow the internet into my directory, 
which I can do with Chamad there. You can also do this, frankly, with FTP, SFTP clients, which is probably via a menu interface that might be a little more straightforward. But that's it. We've had three lectures prior to tonight, and so we have now one title per each. If I look at the source code, I'm not going to see my PHP. I'm instead going to see literally the XHTML that I generated. So let's clean this up a little. I cringe a little bit at the hackish little line breaks there. Let's do something a little more elegant. And let's go ahead and just use an unordered list. Could do a bunch of different things, but I kind of like this because I don't have to use this weird uh, arbitrary line break there. But I do need to do one thing. I could do print. I want to output a line item there. And then I want to do the opposite down here. Now if I reload, I get something a little more you know, HTML 1.0 style, but still at least readable. So now let's insert the numbers in there. I, this, these uh, these uh, things are out of context. So let me go ahead and see this. So for each DOM lecture, all right, I'm in my loop. I have access to the number. How do I get, whoops, how do I get at it? So lecture bracket number. So probably not, but why? So it's an attribute. So we need some other syntax. And here's where the simple XML API really is quite simple. You can index into the element as though it were an associative array. Now there's some PHP magic going on behind the scenes. Lecture, dollar sign lecture, is not an array. It's an object. PHP 5 is actually object oriented. And I'm actually navigating uh, objects in memory, even though I haven't seen a constructor or anything like that just yet. But the syntax that PHP allows you to exercise here is much like that for associative arrays. So let's go ahead and do this. Let me go ahead and make, put some aesthetics there, like a colon and a space, just to separate the two out a little bit. Let me go back to this point here, reload, and there we go. So now we have the lecture number. So we can go further here. Let's now see what resources I have. So beneath each lecture, I want to go ahead and now have an unordered list. Whoops, let me fix that. Let me have an unordered list of each of the resources. So this means I'm going to need another nested loop inside of this nested UL segment. And so how do I do this? Well, I want to iterate over for each lecture has one or more resources, which has a, what is child? What is children, rather? Uh, so resource elements. Let's do a quick reminder. So XML. So notice it looks like this. Resources is a child of lecture, and resource is a child of resources. And then we got to go a little further with all those formats. So let me step back here. So for each lecture's resources child, resource grandchild as resource, but I could call this, this variable anything I want, I want to go ahead and now print out the resource name. Let's start there. So print the resources name, but I don't remember what that name is. So the name is, oh, it's an attribute here. So name equals something. So let's print out quote unquote name. And let's see if that does the trick. But I'm missing one thing. For those familiar with unordered lists, I need to do this thing here. OK. So it's pretty clean. Right? It's kind of following logically the structure of the XML and printing out the hierarchy that I want the HTML to look like. So let's see what now happens. Let me save this, reload my browser. OK, so not bad. Pretty easy, just a few lines of code. Everything's nicely nested, but I'm missing what? What's that? Yeah, so I'm missing the actual data, those formats. All right, so let's see if I can do this. So I could have, let's take a quick look at the XML again. Looks like I have, oh, sometimes I have two formats. And other times I have one format. So let's try, let's just keep it simple. Uh, let me go ahead and print out the resource name, followed by just a little colon to remind me where I'm going. And then let's see. So let's go ahead and do this. For each resource format as format, I'm going to not bother with another unordered list because I just am starting to cringe that I'm nesting this deeply. So we'll pick another aesthetic style for now. I'm going to go ahead and say print, whoops, print the format. I don't even remember what it looks like. Quick sanity check on the XML. A format element has a path. That's what I want to make hyperlinked. And then it has a label. All right, why? Just because that's the convention we came up with. So let me go ahead and do the simple part first. Let's go ahead and print out just the label. And then, you know what, I'm going to do, let's say, print a format label. Let's just keep it simple. 
I am just going to print a vertical bar so that they hang off laterally just like they do on the course's website. No more nesting. All right, reload. Okay, so not bad, but some hyperlinks would be good. And frankly, there's a little bit of aesthetic stuff that making me cringe here, which is this is a little hackish, right? A little trailing line, uh, pipe. Let's leave that alone for now. Um, we can certainly fix that with some conditions or using another approach altogether. But let me come back to that and instead focus on the, um, on the URL. So let's see. We can do this. Print. Sorry, I keep doing wrong function. There is a printf, but we don't need it. Uh, print open bracket a href equals quote unquote something, close quote, close bracket, uh, whoops, close bracket here, this, and then I want to do print, and someone should stop me at some point here. What's the problem? What's that? Yeah, I feel like in most languages, net mixing the same types of quotes here probably not a good idea. So let's change the innermost ones to uh, single quotes. Now, as an aside, in PHP, it's actually important which ones you choose. XML doesn't matter. PHP, it does matter because only in between double quotes are variables interpolated, as we'll say. Interpolate means to take a variable and replace it with its actual value. So if I actually want to put something in this href value field, a variable that I'm going to have access to from the XML, I have to use double quotes on the outside. Otherwise, I will literally see dollar sign something in my web page's output, and that's clearly not what I want. So I can do this in a few ways. Let's try a simple one first. I know that we have a value here. It's called path. So let me just temporarily declare a variable called path and assign it equal to format. Come on, internet latency. Come on, we're so close. Come on, check the internet. Oh, come on. Okay, stand by. We're going 3G. It's kind of sad. On Internet to campus, I need to take out my 56K modem thing here. All right, give me one second. Oh, come on. Oh, hey, it's back. Quick, let's finish this. All right, so format has a has a path attribute too. So let's store this in a variable called path. And now I want to put that path here. So the simplest way I can do this is just like this. Put dollar sign path there. But again, I have to have the double quotes on the outermost ends there. Otherwise, this variable will not be quote unquote interpolated. Let's see what now happens. So I don't, shouldn't have just text now. I should have actual hyperlinks. Really? Happy birthday. All right. So now I actually have hyperlinks. Let me hover over one of these. And it's a little small, but notice at the bottom, I think this URL actually checks out. It's a relative URL because it's just a relative path with the slash. But because it's on the right server, I'm getting what seems to be slash 3 slash source slash lecture 0.pdf. So again, I'll wave my hands at the aesthetics of this for now, just because it's, we'll focus on some juicier things. But we can certainly fix that. But for now, what the key takeaway, hopefully, is just how relatively simple the XML, um, the simple XML API is if you want to get at that data, attributes and child elements alike. Yeah? I'm confused because your variable name is contained within the strong quotes. So how is it getting expanded? Uh, the variable name, the most important quotes are the ones on the outside. These innermost single quotes are just literally quote symbols that will be outputted by PHP to the browser. So if I reverse this, it wouldn't work. So if I change this to a single quote, this to a single quote, and this to a double quote, the yeah, I understand why that doesn't work. Oh, okay. Uh for this here? So right, so this is just a literal character right here, as is this one. However, this one here and this one here demark the start and end of the parameter to the PHP function. And so that's where it matters. You can put anything you want on the inside. In fact, I could, if it makes it a little more clear, I could, although I, frankly, I think this might make it less clear. If I really didn't like single quotes, I just always want double quotes, I can't do this. But I can escape them. So in this context, since we're in PHP, not XML, you do, in fact, escape quotes by using a backslash as opposed to using something like an XML entity. So this would be correct, too. But I find, personally, this very quickly becomes less readable, is all.
All right, so let's see what else we can now do with this API. Take a rest assured that when it comes to project one, which you'll explore in more detail in section this week and next, um, there's many ways we could have even implemented something simple like this, but here's one approach. Yeah? So absolutely. So I was trying to keep things as neat as possible. And you see different styles in PHP. Um, a lot of people are fans of the concatenation operator dot, which you can certainly do to minimize the number of explicit function calls you're making. Though there is a cost computationally to concatenating strings together all of the time. Um, there's folks, too, that I'll disclaim really cringe at how I'm really commingling some code logic here with presentation details, like manually outputting uh, X, uh, HTML tags here. So realize, too, there are other approaches. And towards semester's end, some of you may very well want to explore various templating engines, which allow you to completely factor out the aesthetics and just make placeholders, like variable names, where you want the data to go. Uh, if you would like. So we don't encourage them this early on, because for most people, so much is so new. But um, certainly, if you'd like to, uh, Smarty is a popular one. Cake PHP, Code Igniter is another one. And absolutely, and that was the other point I was going to make with Project 1 and beyond. You'll see in the Project 1 spec that we're pretty clear about what kinds of um, citations you need to include. Nothing formal like a, an essay, but really just comments with URLs or names of sources is fine. But in general, the spirit is if what you want to include in the way of a third party library is really incidental to the project, it would just help with the aesthetics, the layout, it's something you want to learn. By all means, that's totally fine. All power to you if you'd like to incorporate something you're familiar with or you want to learn. If, though, as in the case of Project One, one of the primary themes is implement a shopping cart for this pizzeria, well, finding a third party library that implements a shopping cart would violate the spirit of the spec. So the line is there. And if ever in doubt, just ask us at help at cs75.net. All right, so let's do this in a more sort of real world fashion, not so much as CS75 sandbox. So RSS is very much um, the rage still these days. Some of you might read the news and such with various RSS readers. RSS, the spec, is actually maintained across the street at the Harvard Law School, um, at least the latest incarnation. But RSS is just an XML file. It's an XML file that in its simplest form looks like this. There might be an XML declaration, optionally. There is an RSS root element with a version number. We're up to 2.0 now. Beneath that is a channel child. And inside of that is minimally a title description link, which are uh, sort of self-explanatory, link being the URL of the feed itself or the, or the owner's website. And then inside of uh, the channel element also are zero or more item elements. And conceptually, each item element is meant to represent a news article or a blog post, something along those lines. And each item must have a GUID, which is defined as a unique identifier. Those of you who do use RSS readers, you might be in the habit of deleting articles or flagging them as read. Well, how does your reader know that you've read that article? Odds are it relies on this unique identifier to realize, oh, David's already read this article. Let me hide it from his inbox. Title is the title of the article. Link is the URL. Description, category, pub date, this too has to follow a standard format, but it's all just XML. And so if you have an RSS feed, can you now start writing programs that incorporate this data? So let's give this a try. I'm going to go ahead and go to, let's say, and I'll put the code we just wrote on the fly up online. Let me go to something like New York Times RSS, because RSS feeds abound. Let me go ahead and scroll down here. Let's do something like technology. All right, lots of technology. Let's look at internet. All right, so this is apparently Firefox's rendition of an RSS feed. And this is where people might not realize RSS is just XML. Almost every browser these days, when it sees an XML file, specifically RSS, it renders it in its own Mozilla or Microsoft determined aesthetics. And that generally looks like a web page, but it's really not. In fact, if you look at the source code in most browsers, you'll see the raw XML. That's not always true. I think Safari shows you the HTML they generated based on the RSS, which is kind of annoying if you're trying to debug something. But Firefox indeed shows us the raw XML or RSS. It doesn't matter so much what's in here. There's some juicy stuff that um, we didn't see in the standard format, but up top left, there's the RSS element, there's a channel child, all the other stuff we talked about. So let's try this thing out. So let me go ahead and close this. And I'm going to just copy the URL. Um, and now I'm going to go into a second file here. Let's call this, let's say, newyorktimes.php. I'll start with my other file as a template. newyorktimes.php. Come on. I'm going to connect to Verizon in the meantime as backup so we don't screw this up. 
All right, so now I'm going to open up newyorktimes.php. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all the stuff that was from before. Uh, New York Times. I'm going to get rid of all of this because we'll do something anew. So here lies some of the power of PHP, or more specifically this library. Um, I can just plug in not just a file name, but a whole URL. It's a little ugly because it's wrapping because my font is big, but I can also just paste in this URL. Yeah. So are you using a library? Do you have to declare the library somewhere, or is it just included in PHP? No, in PHP you get almost all of this stuff for free, so long as you've compiled and installed PHP with this module, um, which is the PHP-XML module, um, or uh, it has been included in some other form into the web server's support. Correct. And as I mentioned before, we have been using objects. You can actually say new simple XML elements if you prefer an object-oriented approach. Because the course and because so much of PHP is still by habit um, and by history um, procedural, I'll typically do the former approach just for consistency. But if you prefer this approach, you can absolutely take this. They do one and the same things in this context. So I'll go back to the original now. So now let's just do a little quick and dirty example of these articles. So let me go ahead and iterate. I'm going to do a little differently. I'm not going to, I don't like all those print statements. So I'm going to try to clean this up a little bit, but just show you another uh, design pattern for PHP. So for each DOM has a channel which has items. So for each item as item, I'm going to do this approach, which we saw briefly last week, just a colon. And then I'm going to preemptively close this. It's a stupid token, but it's end for each, no space. But now inside of this, I have access now to dollar sign item because I'm iterating over all of the items in the page. So now what do I want to do here? Well, let's just do something simple. Let me go ahead and output literally a list item, li. And let me go ahead and do a href equals. And now I'm going to come back to that. And now I'm going to come back to the title. Come on, hang in there. Internet. OK, title, close the tag, close the list item. So now I just need two placeholders, right? This is going to be the fastest RSS reader you've ever seen. Implementation, not speed. So the title, how do I get at that? Well, I temper, I can't do this because I'm not in PHP mode, but I can drop into PHP mode pretty quickly. And in fact, using the short tag notation, recall that I can just say equal sign, and this is equivalent to saying echo, which is really the print function. So this is just now a placeholder, dump the title here. This isn't perfect. Things could break here, but I'm going to keep it simple for the moment. And in here, I want to dump out item uh, bracket link, close bracket. And now it's wrapping again because my font's a little big. But let's save this. Let's go back here to our demos. Go to New York Times, uh, NYT.php. And it takes a moment because it's contacting the New York Times. It's got to get the response. Seems the website's being a little slow but, and a little broken. But damn it. Um, for each DOM item. Oh, man. OK, DOM item. Oh, I forgot. Well. Yes, I forgot something. I said it, but I didn't type it. Channel, right? So there's the RSS root, then channel, then zero or more item elements. Let's see if I got it right now. Reload. Oh, say it. Would have been the worst ending to a lecture. So here are all of the articles from the New York Times RSS feed in the same order that I was handed them. I could certainly massage the order in some way if I wanted to. But I did say that there's a couple of gotchas. And again, this will be a recurring theme. Technically, if one of those titles has a scary character, like a less than sign, like someone proves that three is less than two in the title of an article, well, that would break certainly the well-formedness of my site. So really, this is where I want to employ my old friend HTML special chars, again, forgive the ugly wrapping here, that would avoid any scary characters making their way through literally to the web page. I probably don't need to do that in the link unless someone is violating the definition of the RSS spec and putting bogus characters in the link. But we're still left without a way to actually query the data. So what you'll see in section this week and next, and also at the start of next week's lecture, is we'll introduce something called XPath, whereby, and this is kind of the scariest looking form of XPath. It's actually quite simple, C colon backslash, backslash, backslash. It's kind of a more familiar syntax we'll use, like you would on a Windows machine. We can step through our RSS element to our channel element to an item element. And then using the square bracket notation you see a little allusion to over there, you can actually do filtration and get back 
a specific item based on its number, based on its date, based on all sorts of criteria. And you might find with Project One that this empowers you to search for actual data when the user has clicked a link on your website and tried to add it to their cart. So、uh, Sid will be leading today's section across the hall. We also have one on Thursday. And I will see you next Monday for class.